Hi, this is Marcy Davis with Glasscaster, and I am here in Las Vegas today with Peggy Pettigrew-Stewart. How are you doing, Peggy? I'm fine, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, I just couldn't wait to talk to you because I feel like I know you so well because we produced that webinar together, and yet... I just met you really for the first time today, so <laughs> it's really cool. It's like having an old friend you never met, kind of. It's an interesting phenomenon. So welcome, welcome to the podcast. You do a lot of interesting work, and I'm really curious, how did you find your way into glass at the beginning? At the beginning, I was home recuperating from cancer, oh. and I could no longer work in the corporate world. It was... Type A personality, sitting home, not very happy, bored to death. And I started um, picking up stringing beads from my growing up in the 60s in San Francisco. And this was about 12 years ago. And uh, I didn't know you could make your own beads. And a friend of my husband said, oh, well, instead of paying 10 or $15 for a bead, you can make your own. And I, that just floored me. I, I couldn't even imagine it. And I looked for about a year to find a class. There was one in Phoenix, and they had a year waiting list. And lo and behold, driving down the street one day, there was a sign, uh, Bead Making Infused Glass Classes. I made a U-turn, signed up for a weekend of one was bead making and lamp working, and the other was fusing, which I had no idea what it was. Uh, went to day one, couldn't make a bead to save my life. <laughs> I still can't. <laughs> but then I almost didn't go back to day two for fusing, because I didn't know what it was. And I did, and I fell madly in love, overnight addiction. And that's how it started. And then my husband says, you better find a way to make enough money with this to pay for the materials. Because it's kind of <laughs> pricey. Uh-huh. So then, like, what kind of projects did you start out making? Like slump bowls and plates, or what, what were you doing? Uh, mainly jewelry. I started with jewelry because um, I'd always played around with jewelry, uh, doing things in some lapidary work when I was back in school, uh, did lapidary work. And then I always had this desire to do a big bowl. I think everybody who gets into glass at some point says, I want to do a big bowl. <laughs> and so how big was big and how long did it take you to do it? It took me probably two years, and I did a... It was 22 inches. That is a big bowl. And uh, about three eighths inch thick. Wow. And, uh, did, did it have did it have like a, a lip, a rim, or was it just? It was just a uh, a a a deep bowl, probably three inch rise in the middle. Uh huh. And uh, that's what I. I had a, a mold that was a standard mold that you can still buy today and um, had several layers of glass fused together so it would be thick. And How did it turn out? Um, quite well. As a matter of fact, it keeps showing up. It's the traveling gnome bowl, like oh, the Travelocity. Yes. I keep seeing pictures of it pop popping up everywhere here in, uh, at Expo. I found it in three different publications while I was here. Oh, that's kind of fun. So <laughs> what kind of glass do you use? Which which COE, I should say, and then maybe which company? I primarily these days I work with float glass. Okay. Because it's a new territory. I like the thickness of the glass, the clarity of the glass, the sturdiness, and of course it is less expensive. Uh, secondary to that, I work with 96 uh -huh. And that was my learning came through ninety six uh -huh. and uh, but uh, float is is my near and dear to my heart. Well, I would like to know whether or not you have any issues with devitrification. Um, I was lucky enough to have a couple of meetings with um, Henry Halem. Oh, he's the best. <laughs> And also uh, Bondu, who's a friend friend of mine, and John Triggs, who uh, the late John Triggs, who ran uh, Yakagani Glass. Uh -huh. 
and we had long talks about float and where they wanted to go and the problems with it. Uh, even got to see and use a dilatometer to measure the COE of, uh, of any p specific piece of glass. What is a dilatometer? I know a, sp a spectrometer or whatever. I know the thing where you take a stressometer. That's what it was. Bullseye used to sell them. It was mm -hmm. a flashlight with a polarizing, polarizing and, you, and filters and you would put the glass in between and you could see the stress. Mm -hmm. This sounds, is that what that is or is this something much fancier? It sounds much more scientific to me. This, this is a very expensive um, piece Ooh. of scientific technology. Uh, told my husband I wanted one. He says, in your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> it made a cost of a glass lathe and two kilns look cheap. Oh God. But it uh, has a quartz crystal in it and you put a piece of glass in it and uh, it heats to a certain de temperature at a certain rate and then it measures the actual amount of contraction and expansion giving you the COE. Wow! Um, so we talked a great deal about the problems with float glass and also where they hoped the future was. So my husband who's an engineer, he and I sat down with float glass and did um, tests in a normal testing scientific manner where we had uh, 25 samples, they were all fired under the same conditions, but they were 10 side up, 10 side down, single layer, t two layers, three layers, any which way you could think of. We took, got the 10 scope, we did even dichroic coated float, we did the tests and found out that um, the 10 side being the air side did not give us devitrification. And then talking with Henry Halem on several occasions, he also told me that in firing it, the crucial thing is to get the temperature once you've got it, quote, done, to get it down below a thousand as fast as possible and you won't get the devitrification on float glass. Get it down to that upper annealing temperature. Those two things made a huge difference and um, I don't have any problem with it. The only time a student has a problem with it is they get confused, which is the 10 side. Well, so let's go back to that because I, I bet that not everybody understands that in the manufacturing of float glass, it's like molten glass floating on, on 10, right? Mm -hmm. and so explain a little bit about the manufacturing and also please let us know how one would recognize which is the, the 10 side. It's called ribbon technology, which is continuous roll of molten glass, and it's because of that it was one of those technologies that changed, uh, was part of the industrial revolution, because they could make glass strong enough and long enough to make buildings out of it. And it comes out in a continuous ribbon and floats on a bed of molten tin. So keeping it optically correct and straight without having to go through the normal channels that, uh, or hand mixing that uh, the fusible glass goes through. Uh, because of that, the some of the tin gets absorbed into one side of the glass. Because of that, it's it's, it's a coating, and the way you try to figure out what it is. There is a way that you can see visually, but the best way is taking a special tin scope, which is a short wave black light, that you shine on it, and on one side it looks foggy. The other side you don't see anything. The foggy side is the tin side. Or if you put a couple of drops of water on one side, it pulls in and tries to make a circle. The other side, it has ra ragged edges, and the one that it pulls in is the tin side, because so, it's got a coating and makes it smoother. It's kind of like if you put Rain-X on your windshield? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, so um, the tin side is up, and then you eliminate the, um, the mm -hmm. divot. Okay. God, that's so interesting. And, Henry Hallam, I, I interviewed him once in a, in a podcast. And it was one of the most important ones I ever did because he is the one who said basically, listen to this, guys, but COE, coefficient of expansion, 
is total crap when it comes to determining the real compatibility of glass. I am sorry to say it's a number and we love numbers and they make us feel comfy, cozy and secure, but it isn't really it. In case you ever wondered why you had two different you know, glasses that were the same COE but they didn't stay together, it's because what really counts is viscosity. It's the softening point of the glass. And if the glass softens at the same rate, the same temperatures, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then and cools, and the, you know, the flow rate is the same, it can be a few points off numerically, and it will stay together. And that's what that's why I interviewed him, and that's what he taught me. And mm -hmm. God bless him for that, because it, of course, it throws everything out the window, but it helps you <laughs> understand why you can have failures within things that have the same COE. Meanwhile, onward and upward, so after your 22 inch bowl and figuring out the tin side up, you do some really interesting techniques and projects, so tell us what you developed. Well, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There was so much beautiful fused glass out there and beautiful bowls and I just I didn't want to be following in their footsteps. I met a woman who did some beautiful glass um, mainly sinks and she taught me or introduced me to a process called Ver Eglomise which is working with glass in talio, which is a fancy word for meaning on the underside or in reverse. So I learned this process of kiln forming my glass and sand carving it in on the underside, painting and gilding. She had only, only worked with flat glass, so then I started saying, well, why can't I do this on curved glass? So I've spent 12 years developing the process, which I teach and am teaching here at Expo, but I said there's got to be some other ways, so I got interested in doing um, face castings in various series, and I said I wonder if I can do that and add very um and try to cast a face using standard uh, studio materials. I don't have a furnace. I love to cast glass, but I don't have the materials and equipment to do it in my studio. So I've got kilns and flat glass, so how can I do this? So I created a process and technique to actually get life-size faces cast in glass and then eventually added the very glamise technique to it. So Tell us a little bit about how you do the technique, because I guess the fact that you did lapidary work, you're cold working, you were familiar with that, so that probably just tied right in. But when, you know, even just flat, before you start doing your curves, <laughs> tell us the sequence of events to do the very glamis glass. Uh, doing the very glamis glass would start with your palette, which is a piece of glass. It would either be flat, or kiln sculpted, formed, or cast, whichever you want to work with. Then I we, we put on resist and draw a pattern and take and sand blast or sand carved, carve that pattern in. Mm -hmm. From there, we then <clears throat> paint the glass using oil paints, although we're experimenting with some new techniques, but using artist oil paints and blending and trying to get a color blends to blend like watercolors. Very dramatic uh, but subtle and then inlay of copper, silver, or gold. Not just the composition, but using 22 karat gold, fine silver, as well as the composition, uh, copper, silver, and gold foils that are available out there. So, so it's gilding. It's it's like it's foils, right? It's like mm -hmm. sheets, yes. and you buy them in a pack, and you yes, you know, put them in there and stuff like that. Okay, and then how do you protect the? Um, the foils on the back so that they don't, you know, tear and get ruined and stuff. We tried a lot of different ways. A couple of artists I knew were putting felt uh, with spray ad adhesive on it, and I that wasn't what I wanted, so I experimented with, there was a sealer that the 
company that made the uh, gold size ad adhesive used, but it was also too soft. And I finally found a product that um, called Liquifusion that was made by Robin Evans, and then it's been, I think, sold or moved or whatever. It was a two-part polymer epoxy type sealer that was developed as the, what I was told for mosaic work where they wanted to use fused glass in mosaic work but they didn't want grout. They wanted it to look like a continuous clear glass between. And I said, I wonder if that would work as a sealer and wouldn't hide the beautiful colors of the gold, the silver, variegated gold and so I started experimenting, and sure enough, it covered it very, very well, made it hard like glass and as shiny and clear as glass. Which is kind of a cool thing because if any of you do any fusing, you know that on the underside, the bottom side of, um, of your project, the part that hit the, the kiln shelf, it's usually got kind of a texture to it unless you're using iridescent or something like that, but usually it's the dull side, so you found a way to make it shiny, mm -hmm. and, shiny and smooth and pretty. It was a godsend when we experimented and found that it would work and the uh, only problem is now is trying to find the product, but I believe that one of the major glass suppliers has a new um, reformulated uh, version of that, and I've just got the first batch, and I'm going to try it here in the next few days. Oh, good. And you also know of a much lower tech, less expensive protection <laughs> that will you share? <laughs> the... Um, the best thing that we found, other than that, is Rust-Oleum um, metallic spray paint. That if you're using silver or copper or gold, they have a nice, bright, shiny metal um, Rust-Oleum. And it seals perfectly, wonderfully, and you still have the col color of the copper, silver, or gold. And it won't rust. <laughs> <laughs> it won't rust, and it stays on, and it doesn't dissolve the leaf or the paint, which mm -hmm. we tried a lot of products that destroyed all of our work, that it melted the the paint and the, the leafing, and it was just a mess, and this was the only thing that worked mm -hmm. and uh, fills in any little gaps and uh -huh. uh, works wonders. Wow. I stumbled upon a product uh, and out of sheer necessity I tried this new paint product. I've been using the oil paint for years because nothing else worked for adding the color in very glamis. And we were I had to get a piece ready for a major exhibition, couldn't get the time to finish it properly, and I found these paints uh, called uh, uh, Glass Magic, mm -hmm. but these were ones that weren't firing type. And I played with them, and I was amazed. They had transparents that acted like watercolors, but they are permanent solvent-based paints. And I played with them on a whole lot of different things, from wine glasses to deep carved half-inch thick glass. And I was getting these really neat looks. Um, I contacted the um, owner of the company and I said, you know, I'd like to try some of these. And we, he was kind enough to come and attend our class, Craig at um, Hovell uh, Manufacturing, if I'm okay to say that. Uh -huh. uh, Craig attended the class, sat in, brought his paints, and we tried them, and the class tried them, and we had some fabulous results. So it still is, we need to work out some of the uses and how it's used and any kind of difficulties or um, where things don't quite gel working this this ingredient with that ingredient or what colors and and the sealers and all of that but so far I'm really excited about it it's a whole new new look and a new method and a new technique 
You also have another love besides glass, and you've managed to combine your glass with your other passion, which is music. Specifically, old school, summer of love, San Francisco Bay bands. The art of music, the music of art. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area during the Woodstock and summer of love, and grudgingly we'll say Altamont. But there was so much of that mu music started and changed our lives, and uh, looking back to our junior high and high school days and the first loves and all of the things that we grew up with. That was uh, people like Santana we went to high school with and didn't have their first albums and we saw them start from a garage next door to superstars. And I said I would really like to somehow combine uh, the glass and this love of the, the music through some crazy things that happened and the faces. I found out that there was a glass artist that I had gotten to know in Tucson who is, works with the Sonoran uh, Art Glass Institute and his name is Michael and it turns out Michael is Mr. Michael Joplin, Janis Joplin's brother. And from there, he put me in touch with some other people. I have people. chills going <laughs> up and down my spine. <laughs> oh, oh, and it's funny, he had Janice's painted Porsche in his backyard under a tarp for years. Oh, my God. Until gosh, just recently. I, I mean, I, have, I, I used to have a poster that hanging on my wall. <laughs> I mean, that Porsche is sort of like... Like the coolest tattoo you ever saw, like a street, mm -hmm. it's just, and like the, oh my gosh. Anyway, so continue. He uh, introduced me to Sam Andrew, who is, still is the lead guitarist and founder of Big Brother and the Holding Company, which was Janice's band. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Sam one day on the phone after he wrote me a beautiful letter about a piece that he admired that I done, had done of a, an actress, a soap opera actress. And um, he, I told him, I said, I have this dream that I'd like to do an exhibition. I'd like to cast the musician faces, not just the band, but the musicians who were part of that, and tell their story. I had done some pieces of the Hopi, and to me they were storytellers. There was um, a lot of different parts to it. Every song has a melody, harmony, and a rhythm. So to me, the face in the center is the melody. Around the outside, and these are round pieces like a, a record or CD, is the storytelling. That's the harmony, the many voices, the many sounds. And the texture of the glass is the rhythm. So I talked to Sam, and he, within two days, he and his wife drove from Marin in Northern California to Arizona to meet with me and to let me cast their faces. We came up with an idea for a joint exhibition, having his art, uh, we joke calling it something old, something new, something rock and roll and blues. <laughs> and it has his art of today because he's, he's doing uh, painting, my art doing the face, but also doing uh, some reverse carving in the very iglamis of photographs in a giant collage. and. Also, I was offered some of the old Fillmore posters by the original artists to be able to use those to carve them into glass so that we make this exhibit. From there, he gathered a lot of his friends who said they were interested in participating. So now we have, I have about 15 cast, uh, everyone from um, Big Brother and the Holding Company, uh, several of the Jefferson Airplane, David Crosby, uh, Country Joe McDonald uh, from Country Joe and the Fish, Barry Melton from the Fish, um, people from Moby Grape. Um, <laughs> just, it's been an incredible, amazing journey. Um, and we have Santana, the entire band of Santana is reforming all the original members and they've consented to let me do their casting um, and uh, the joke is of course that I'm a different type of plaster caster my I set my my sights a little higher <laughs> and for those of you who are a little bit older you'll understand what I'm talking about something from the 60s 
So, so what is the actual physical process that takes place when you want to um, make a, a casting, you know, you take an impression of their face? I mean, do, do you put coconut oil or Vaseline all over their face and, and, and straws up their nose so they don't suffocate? How, how do you do it? And then what are the steps? Do you mind telling me how? Um, not a problem. I had to develop it because there really wasn't any instructions out there how to do it with the equipment I had because I didn't have all of the ways to cast it and do it the way you would do in at Pilchuck Glass School or something. So I started doing, I found that there was surgical gauze, not regular gauze, that you can, that they use for setting arms and also taking impressions for, um, it's sad to say, amputees. So I found that I, from a sculpture shop, that was product was available and I got to know a gentleman who is a Hollywood makeup artist who has just won an Academy Award for special effects and he did Michael Jackson and Thriller and Edward Scissorhands and I, I said his name is William Forche I said how do you do how do you make faces and so he told me about certain products uh, that you can buy that are alginates that you could actually eat. Uh, the sea seaweed base or something? What yep, sea seaweed and minerals. Um, and then went back to basics and found out there's all these fancy products, but good old Vaseline worked the best mm -hmm. at, with this. So that I you know, take the Vaseline and there is a product sold at sculpture shops that you put on hair and beards and mustaches that won't stick to it and uh, still allow you to get the impressions. Wow, I never even thought about like facial hair. How how do you <laughs> get it out of the, I guess, plaster? I, mean, yes. I don't know. Would you like to donate your mustache to this project? <laughs> I mean, I can see where that would be an issue. Yeah, it was a little scary the first one I had to do. It's like my husband wouldn't let me do his. so. <laughs> I had There's trust for you. <laughs> the first one I did, it, it was kind of scary because it was uh, a gentleman they called Banana who is with the Young Bloods, um, <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> and I was scared to death, but I that had was been assured. Funny, by the way, what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I put the stuff on him and uh, uh, it worked perfectly and I I don't put straws up their nose <laughs> and I convince my subjects or victims that I'm giving them a facial <laughs> so they they go in with this not feeling quite so um, terrified yes <laughs> and I've got it down to where they're only in the plaster for about 10 minutes so it's it's um, the Vaseline and then the plaster gauze. gauze. Pla plaster gauze. So is it just, because I've never done it, so is it gauze and then you add something to it? Or, I mean, is it impregnated with the plaster? Or how does it work? It's impregnated with the plaster. Mm -hmm. Again, a surgical grade, because if you use those the standard gauze plaster, it can give you second-degree burns. I was going to ask about So um, you can buy that stuff at hobby stores, but you can't. you can hurt someone with it. And so it is a surgical grade, and I have learned how to almost like Braille feel the face to get it into the right crevices and the shapes. Um, then it dries in about 10 minutes, and we take it off. And that's the beginning of. Does it pop off like when it's done? Does it just sort of. Or, or do you, have uh, you have to, to kind of it? you have to kind of break the the seal and let air in by pulling up at the side by the cheek or under the chin, mm -hmm. and then the air gets in and the vacuum suction is broken and it comes right off. Do, do people have difficulty with being claustrophobic? Do you feel like get them to breathe and play new age music to calm <laughs> them down? No, I'm serious, you know, because you can get that feeling and then then you can't move. Also, I mean, what? Um, How do you the help? one lady I, I did who's an actress, she's also a hypnotist, and she self-hypnotized herself 
Um, another one, we had a bunch of music. We were at uh, a special event out in California with all these musicians. And so they had music going and we were talking and trying not to make them laugh. Uh, break there. Uh, and I, I got them t thinking, now do you think your music is too loud? You know, I got them thinking about their music and I've not, surprisingly, not had anyone have a problem. I'm extremely claustrophobic, so I'm very cognizant of what I'm doing to other people. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it. I'm not especially claustrophobic, but I, I think that you could have that, that reaction <laughs> to that experience. So, okay, so after you have successfully not burned their face, removed <laughs> their facial hair, and caused them to have a psychotic episode, and you remove this thing, now, and then you probably wash the vaseline on yes. your face, what do you do with this, this impression that you've taken? I take the plaster um, casting, and then I will reinforce it by adding additional plaster strips and I have plaster uh, solution that I apply with um, a paintbrush just to stabilize it and keep it strong on the outside. From there I have to make a, uh, that's the negative, I have to make a positive. So I make, um, once it's dry, it takes three or four days for that to dry, I mix a plaster mixture I have to put Vaseline in the mold again so that the plaster won't stick to the gauze mold. Mm -hmm. And I pour that, let it sit for several days. It has to dry and it does take quite a while. I pop that out and then I have to sculpt. There may be some imperfections and I surround myself with pictures of the people so they think I'm a crazed fan. <laughs> He's just another groupie. <laughs> and I surround myself with their pictures so that I can make any corrections in the facial. Uh, if there's flaws or maybe I got a bubble in the plaster, uh, I make those corrections. Then after that's done and it's dry, I make a rubber mother mold that is a two-part resin rubber silicone um, that you end up making a dam and you put your, your plaster in there and you have to pour that over it. Again, another week to dry. And then you pop that out. And there's so many places that this whole thing can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Every place yeah. along the way, I'm sure it could. And then fail. once that comes out, that becomes the, the uh, crucible, or, or I, that's the wrong word, but the unit that I use to make mix up the material that will actually form the face that goes into the kiln. It plaster and clay are too hard for the detail work. The glass when it cools contracts and it breaks the glass. So I had to develop and experiment with various materials that would hold together and show enough detail like eyelashes and uh, lines in the lips but yet wouldn't break and so the mold is a one-use mold. Mm -hmm. um, I can make another face using that mother mold out of the silicone. Mm -hmm. um, then I build the mold in the kiln. I take that face um, if it's survived all of those steps um, and I put it in the kiln and then I start building the story and but, get it ready. Okay, and then the glass, what, does the glass drape over, slump into, how, how does it work? I am, uh, a, several friends of mine and people, um, Boyce Lundstrom came to my studio uh, several times to see what in the world I was doing because he had heard about this crazy face making. And I said, I don't know what I'm doing. Am I slumping? Am I fusing? He says, you're kiln casting. And I said, oh. And he says, nah, actually it's kiln sculpting. So we coined it as kiln sculpting. It's a, an advanced, um, extreme method of slumping. The glass is flat glass suspended above 
the face. It has to be above the highest point of the face, which is the, the nose. nose. Right. And it has to be able to drape down, not catch any air bubbles. And so you do it slow to get the, or how, how do you do it to keep the, you, you gotta, especially around the nose, I would think as it would fall, it would, it would trap air bubbles around the uh, nostrils or something. I mean, <laughs> with the help of Henry Halem uh -huh. and also um, a, a few other people, David Keynes, uh, Boyce Lundstrom, I had the opportunity to work with a number of them uh, and looking at the, um, Graham Stone of fusing firing schedules, we came up with a very unique to most people firing schedule. It's quite fast, causing the glass to fall first in the middle, top middle, and then out works outward. So it pushes the air out. Okay. But it's fast, it's unusual, most people shake their head, say it won't work, can't work, but if you look at the graphs and schedules from uh, some of the most famous casters in, you know, from uh, Czechoslovakia and Romania, um, and we've all looked at them, and it follows a very certain um, steps where there's a kind of a warm-up or preheat, and then you take it up to what I call is done, then a very fast crash, cool to annealing, to, as Henry Halem told me, and then we go through an upper and lower annealing range, mm -hmm. which is very slow at that point. But it's it's very simple, but it is a bit different, and um, I use it for the float glass and also the other glass. I also have been working with dichroic float glass quarter inch thick and CBS has been great at help at working with me testing some of this new products and doing the uh, faces especially the psychedelic faces music faces so so do you usually use like one piece of quarter inch or how like what, is does it vary or or are you you know dropping <laughs> fritz on top of I mean like how do you we're, get this to happen? There's been several things. One where I would take um, the quarter inch float glass that's dichroic coated and fusing it to another quarter inch um, non coated float. Then there's been times Is the where dichro in the middle? It was sometimes it was on in the middle, sometimes on the top. That was part of the experiment. Okay. The next phase was getting thick float glass and having it coated and then putting it in the kiln, like half inch thick float glass. The next phase that we're in that uh, Howard and Dana have been great working with me is I'm actually doing the entire face casting in half inch thick float glass or five eighths inch thick glass and they're coating it after the fact. That would be the... the shiniest, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. the, like the most brilliant, reflective? Yes. Okay. And it's uh, doing it on the underneath or the back side so that it's got this very thick clear cap mm -hmm. on it. So there's a lot of different um, That would maximize procedures. the brilliance of it then. Wow. So it's, it's just uh, float glass has been amazing and confusing uh, at the same time, you were talking about COE, uh, they estimate float glass to be somewhere around uh, 82, mm -hmm. but it's not manufactured for COE, it's for tensile strength and clarity. Mm -hmm. However, it melts at a lower temperature than the bead glass. What, what temperature? It is usually about 1,200 degrees. No kidding. And I, I asked some of the same people we've talked about, I said, and, and also Shorty Seal from uh, Spectrum Glass, I said, can you tell me why, I said, I've always heard that the higher the COE number, the faster it melts and the lower the temperature. And 
he says, yes, that's true. I said, why with float glass that's estimated at about 82, is it melting faster? And he says, well, his, in his estimation, it was because of the minerals and materials and the tin that is Something used. Like a flux? Is the yes. The flux? Oh yes. my God. So it, it, working with float glass, it's like a never ending oh. um, learning curve, and it really makes you want to become a scientist because it's like, why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with all the things we've been taught when you start learning glass. Do you use enamels and other coloring agents on the glass at all? or I have not used any firing enam enamels yet. Um, this new product uh, that the Color Magic and that I'm testing is the first time that I'm using non-oil paints or sandblasting uh, or just the dichroic. So this is all brand new you, with the painting. Are you using the Veriglamese techniques yes. with them after you're done? So how long does it take for you to make a single face? From start to finish, two to three months because there's so many steps and each step has at least a week of time if I do nothing else. So it's, it, it's a very complicated process. It's not always 100% successful. Uh, I'm still developing it. I, at some point, will teach it only when I can do it, um, teach it so that the students can have it repeatable for them. Mm -hmm. I find it's amazing that using glass, it's so thick, you still have such detail of every you know, nuance and wrinkle and, and texture in the face. I mean, I, I think it's just incredible. I, I've i seen them only in pictures, and I would like to see one up close and personal. I would, <laughs> I would like to videotape and document one of these processes from beginning to end, or at least from when you bring them in and put the Vaseline on and do all that. And I, I just think that would be amazing. And... Uh, you yeah, the, the, the rock and roll world and the glass world are both so lucky to have you <laughs> and your infinite patience to be willing to devote so much time. By the way, um, these are their present faces. You're casting the face they're wearing today. Yes. <laughs> not some sort of reproduction of what they look like at right. Woodstock. And, and so that just makes it. And then you've got that history and the richness of all of those, you know, I hate wrinkles, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All of the history that you wear on your face for the privilege of having been walking around the planet for a while. And I just, I think it's incredible. And I'm really just grateful to know the story and to be able to share it because it's a story worth sharing. Thank you. It's been a labor of love. It's my legacy in that and my curiosity to find out what made these people and their journey, my inquisitiveness about other artistic minds, where did it, where did it come from? What, what makes them so good at what they're doing? Where did this come from? And to hear the backstories and, um, and about the journey, about these legends, it's just been amazing. Uh, to me and to then the challenge to be able to do something technically with glass to do this. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled that I was able to figure it out and be able to be connected to this, uh, the people and be able to meet the right people who have put me in touch with the right people who it's just been an incredible journey and adventure and um, right now, I believe the Smithsonian and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame are going to house uh, some of the permanent uh, pieces in their permanent collection. Good for you. That's terrific. I, I want you to keep me informed. <laughs> and I, you got to come and be part. I'm inviting you, open invitation to come and be part of it and see any part of it you want to. I would, I would like to. I think it would be such a privilege to help 
document you documenting them. Mm -hmm. And so, boys and girls, be on the lookout and see what we do next in the continuing uh, saga is not the right word, but ad adventure of uh, casting in glass the rock and roll legends of the San Francisco Bay Area Summer of Love. And on that happy note, I would like to thank you, Peggy, for sharing your story with us. This is Marcy Davis with Glasscaster. Thanks for listening.